Hey, greetings, and welcome back to another episode of the Relationship Schools podcast. I'm your host, Jason Gaddis. Really glad to be here with you right now. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for subscribing, sharing with a friend, etc. We are all about relationships here. We're about loving better. We're about uh, learning how to work through our differences better. We are about um, getting educated on social and emotional and relational skills that maybe we didn't get growing up. Uh, that's what you're going to get here, all right? In the recent weeks here, with the death of and the murder of George Floyd and the uprising that's happened as a result, uh, really around racism, uh, man, things have gotten extremely intense for a lot of us in the streets, depending on where you live, in your cities, in your home, uh, online, certainly when we, when we watch the news or whatever, wherever we consume the news. So, you know, I'm over here in deep contemplation and as a white man wondering and sometimes freezing and uh, just asking questions and like, okay, what can I do? Knowing that I'm, I feel like I'm already doing so much to help just people, humans, no matter where they come from and what they look like, helping humans work out their differences. That's what I take a stand for in life. And um, to be really clear, my position on racism is I'm anti-racist. I'm anti-white supremacy. Um, I, I, it just blows my fucking mind that people actually think someone with a different skin color is less than somehow. And as, we, as I look at the deeply embedded nature of white supremacy and systemic oppression, it starts to become clear why that's the case. And I talked today with my guest about this. And um, I don't, I'm not here to teach you about it. Uh, I'm just finding my way. In this episode, I've got Louisa Duran, who goes by Weez. And uh, I'm just going to share a few words about Weez, and I'll, I'll talk about how we met and um, our journey and why I wanted to bring her on. So she's a compassionate provocateur. She's a coach, educator, and podcaster, guiding folks on a trauma-informed decolonization and anti-racism journey. That's her Instagram bio. On Instagram, she's at according to Weez. And um, her website is Louisa with a Z Duran. Yeah, so she's... Um, I'm just going to read a couple words of her intro. Um, Hey, I'm Louisa Dran, but call me Weez. I'm a cishet, amazing tribe from Northwest Africa, able-bodied, female-identifying human. I use she, her, they, them as pronouns, and I'm a Bay Area born and bred Oakland stand-up. I speak three languages, and my first loves are music and boxing. I've been called many things from coach, podcast host, advocate, agent of change, strategic strategist and educator, and ultimately I'm a compassionate provocateur. Um... A little background on me, she's got a BA in sociology from Berkeley and having parents that were born into colonial Africa, it's a field she wanted to study as I was radicalized from a young age and felt a deep call to understand people, society, and human behavior. Post-graduation, she worked in music and professional sports, all the way taking notice uh, of all the way black and brown bodies and culture were used as commodified and popular culture in America. Uh, and it goes on and on. So she's, she's, um, I first heard about her through, uh, Jesse Corn's event, uh, Jesse and Sharla of, uh, Thrive. And, uh, I heard Trudy speak and just on racism and being a transformational company. And she was challenging us to look within at our biases and just how we run business and how we're helping people. So, I was inspired and confronted and was like, shit, I got to educate myself here. And this was in the uh, fall of 2018. So in January of 2019, I took a course on race, equity, diversity uh, for white people. And it was taught by two women of color, Trudy and Weez. And I uh, had some big breakthroughs and um, that course was really challenging and enlightening and you know liberating ultimately. And it set me on a path to just be more equitous in my behavior, personally as well as professionally. 
yeah. So, uh, and then I had an incident go down after the, after the class, uh, slightly after the class, uh, or maybe it was toward the tail end of the class, which is just interesting timing where someone accused me and our company of being racist. And, um, I did some private coaching with Weez and she helped me through it. And, um, it was amazing how she supported me and, uh, this company through that. Uh, and she just was, uh, really had our back actually. And uh, really challenged the other person who was coming at us because they were doing it so poorly. And like she says in this interview, you'll hear her, I make mistakes. Jason makes mistakes. Yes, Jason kind of fucks it up sometimes. But I'd rather talk and kind of flounder my way through it than to stay silent. That's better for me. I'm not going to tell you what's best for you, but that's better for me. And so I just attempted to have a conversation. And so you're going to notice some awkward moments. You're going to notice me fucking something up here in this interview. I, I try to take my own stab at defining racism. She corrects me or adds, you know, fills it out a lot more. <laughs> and I'm still just, again, blown away that uh, we will look at each other as less than or more than when uh, just due to our phenotype, the color of our skin. So I hope this serves, guys. I really do. Um, again, this isn't, the relationship school isn't uh, going to be doing a year's worth of this kind of podcast, but to me, the timing is crucial and I want to be in on this conversation right now so that we can improve as an organization. And your, uh, just the, the standard relationship content, which I've pushed pause on right now, will be back here soon. But I want to get a couple podcasts in here that are addressing racism and equity uh, because it matters, right? This is the conversation we're all in. And uh, I want you to have more education and tools. So we've agreed to meet with me, and she's busy as hell right now fighting the fight. And so I was grateful for her time. So let's just get right into it. Um, yeah. And there's a good call to action at the end that I, uh, I want everyone to take her class. Okay. That's coming up. She's doing a very affordable $97 class. So listen for that at the end. Uh, if you, especially if you're a white person and, and are kind of struggling right now, freezing, not sure what to do. Uh, this class I think is going to be really helpful uh, and follow her on Instagram, of course. Okay. Let's dive in. Welcome to the show. Wheeze. Hi. Hey, welcome uh, to the Relationship School podcast. I'm grateful to have you here. I'm I'm excited to be here. Yeah. It's like and a reunion. I know, totally. <laughs> um, so just to give the listener context here, um, we met because I took a class on mm -hmm. race and equity from you and Trudy, yes. uh, who both are hosts of the That's Not How That Works podcast. And I can't, I think I found out about you. Oh, that's right. I went to a transformational leadership summit. I met Trudy mm -hmm. through Jesse Corin, blah, blah, blah. Long story is <laughs> I was like, I need to take this class. Um, I'm in the transformational kind of leader space. Right. And I think I know some things, but uh, Trudy said a few things that I was like, uh, what? <laughs> what? Uh, I guess I don't know some things. <laughs> yeah. Plus I had just a little more back context. I had, um, over the years, I've just gotten mostly white people sort of shaming me or making me wrong for how I'm doing it, whether it's gender, race, whatever it is. And so I'm like, okay, I, fine, I'm listening and I'll, I'll mm -hmm. do, do some homework here. So I signed up for your seven week course and it, it uh, blew my mind. Uh, it was super helpful. I had some big ahas, awakenings. And then since then, we've implemented a lot of cool stuff. We uh, did a equity training for our team. Uh, we offer scholarships for people of color now. So uh, thanks to you. So uh, anyway, thank you. And you're welcome. Yeah. Again, just grateful to have you here. So give us a little intro. I, I introduced you formally there a couple minutes ago when I read your bio, but just can you give us a sense of um, what you're doing right now and who you are? Yeah. So, um, gosh. So, well, I do. I always say like I'm a multi hyphenate because I do a lot of different things because the movement is multi pronged. Um, and what I mean by the movement is literally like direct action that is involved in moving our system and our society forward towards equity, justice, um, inclusion, and what I call like a process of liberation. Like I, I believe deeply in liberation theology. Yeah. Um, so I'm an anti-racist uh, and a decolonization I like to call myself a guide now because I'm like re reclaimed the word. Um, so I'm a guide and I use the tools of facilitation, education, um, you know, coaching, 
Uh, and I also have like a trauma-informed lens. So I marry all of those things together to take people through both an explicit anti-racism journey as well as a decolonization journey because racism is only one part of the, right, the equation and the conditioning. There's nuances and intersectionality is important. Mm -hmm. So I do that. And um, at the root and core of what I do, I'm actually a political um, like activist organizer. Um, so right now I'm like, I'm in it. I'm, I'm in it, right? Not only just like educating constantly, but part of lar large back-end organization efforts, um, not only for the fight for justice, but we're calling for police reform and, you know, abolitionism within regards to police reform, um, defunding the police. So there's a massive movement happening right now, and I'm a part of that. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. Um, I can imagine you're unbelievably full, busy <laughs> right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so just to frame the conversation again to, to the obvious, which is George Floyd's murder, uh, you know, classic white dude just killing a black man uh, mm -hmm. in public and uh, in a position of power, uh, justifying it for however the hell he justified it. Uh, blatant racism. And then it wakes up. It wakes up a movement again uh, in right. the culture, which is a good thing, but it came at a price. Um, I mean, just how... You know what? What given this is the circumstances, what and how people are responding? What do you see is is going on here, and how are how are we doing in our response so far? Yeah. So I <laughs> this is always like a question to answer, where it's like you want to be careful of answering it because I don't want to like dishearten anyone or like you know make and you've you've been through my course, so like this is languaging you understand, but I don't want to trigger as you know mm, different languaging. I don't want to activate anyone's like fragility or like their, you know, the, sh the white guilt or the shame or the tears and all of the things that can happen inside of folks. Yeah. So I put an asterisk on that saying, this whole conversation might make you uncomfortable. There might be things that I say that you make you question how you're doing it or if you're doing it right. But that's also an invitation to do better. Right. Yeah. That if you're being activated, there's an invitation inside of you to lean into this work. That is actually a good thing because that means you're not actually you're not a racist. Right. Right. Right now we have racists and we have anti-racist and there's no in between. There's no middle ground. You can't just like be casually not racist. Right. I'm on you the have fence. to pick a side. Right. Right. Like, uh, I mean, I don't like put my knee on anyone's neck, but like, yeah, no, 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 no. Like you have to take a stand. Right. Totally. So I'm going to preface all of that. Um, I think right now there's two, there's three, actually, there's three things happening. There are racists that are just like vehemently committed to upholding the system. So we're not going to talk about them, right? We're going to talk about folks who actually want to be part of the solution. Yeah. And within that camp, there's two things happening. There's white folks, um, and non-black folks specifically, because while, you know, people of color do experience racism right now, we're talking about black lives. So, yeah. uh, white folks and non, non-black people of color who are like, I'm with it. I'm with the movement. I get it. I see the need to like use my voice and get actionable. And I understand that I, I understand that I don't really understand, but I know that I know enough to know that I should be following the leadership of like explicitly like black voices and anti-racists and activists who have been doing this work a long time, who learned from folks before them. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to follow the lead, which we'll get to my like little analogy for to make to clear that up for people in a second, but which is what we want to be doing. And the second thing that I'm seeing is predominantly white folks and or non-black folks of color who are in this position of like spending more time and energy almost arguing with each other mm. about what the right thing to do is. Yeah. And their energy is really being wasted because while y'all are sitting here figuring out like, what do I do and how do I do it? And you're doing it wrong. And like, to your point, and, and I know this cause I was a part of when this happened to you once, right? Yeah. Like other white folks coming and like policing and the woke Olympics and like, this is what I hear yeah. in my head. Yeah. <laughs> that is, is quite frankly, as the way that I see it, right? Like if you're not anti-racist, you're in racist, that is so distracting and such a waste of time and energy that you're actually upholding the system. Yeah. So I'm seeing a lot of that. And again, I get that it's coming from a well-intentioned place, but again, anti-racist, black folks and activists have been yelling for like the last two weeks that like, we've got this. <laughs> we've been giving y'all, giving y'all the exact steps the direct actions. We've told you who to tweet. We've told you where to show up and when we've told you what to do. 
and there's folks doing it, and then there's folks arguing about how to do it best. Yeah, thank you. That's that happened to me just the other day. I did my first uh, post on my fan page, and I I got a you know good uh, plenty of people commented like thank you, and other people were like no, that's not how you do it, and they just started just attacking or correcting or and I was like, is this a really good use of your time? Seriously. <laughs> It's and not. it was all, and it was mostly white people for me. It was just, right. most of the time I'm criticized, it's it's white people telling me I'm doing it wrong. Right, right. And then, and you know, and I will, again, context and, and preface matters, um, because we're talking about black lives right now, if a black person comes into the space and is like, yo, that's some white shit, right? You know that because you've been yeah. through the course. I'm like, cool. You're Got like, it. okay, look, I, I'm going to listen. But this is for anyone else. Like the one thing we're going to make sure to expressly say is that, we don't, we're not going to judge black folks on how they're showing up in this moment, how they're taking up space or not taking up space. And if they tell you that there's a problem, believe them. Right. Right. We just need to like explicitly yeah. say that, but yeah, it's all I'm seeing is white folks arguing with white folks. Right. Like, and all of you are wrong that are arguing with each other. <laughs> like to be clear, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, this was what a are su you doing? super validating part of the course that I took. Cause I, I came in with some you know, some shame and some, I'm doing it wrong. And I was vast majority of those people, 99.9% .9 of the people were, because I I was felt like I was getting shamed by white people. And it was really refreshing to hear you be like, dude, I hear you. Um, mm -hmm. And then for me to get actually educated here was, right. was awesome. Right. And there is a distinct difference, right? Like, do you mind if I, I'm not going to speak directly to the situation, but just sure. like your reaction to yeah. it. Do you, oh, right. Please. So like, there was, there's, there is always a reality that like, sometimes you're not going to get it right. Yeah. Like for sure. But, yeah. but because like when, you know, when, cause I know you had said like you had had experiences like that in the past, but like when we were in the course and you had a whole bunch of white folks come for you, right. There were moments of like, oh, Jason, you could have done that better. For sure. And there was some of it where it was like, oh, these, this is the woke Olympics. And I checked those people and I yeah. still, yeah. and I actually no longer associate with that organization and told them explicitly why. Uh -huh. Um, because that happened, right? The, that woke Olympics bullying does happen. Yeah. And sometimes white folks will like, you know, there's like the phenomena of like, maybe even if another white person was the one that told you like, ah, Jason, that wasn't exactly it. Right. Yeah. That can be true too. But it's the way that we're engaging exactly. with the content. It's the way that we're engaging with each other. Yeah. Because when you're coming to someone and you're like, Jason, you're fucking up. This is not how you do it. Like that's, that's my, that's my arguing white person noise. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I hear. That's all I hear. Yeah. Um, it's like waka, waka, waka. It's the same thing. Right. Um, right. Like one that puts you now in a position of you're just going to shut down. You're going to stop listening. It's not effective. So to the white folks that are doing the woke Olympics bullying, you're actually detracting. You are causing white folks that would be accomplices and would be co-conspirators to take steps away from the movement. Mm -hmm. So you're part of the problem. One. Yeah. And two, it doesn't, that's not to say that there isn't maybe some valid, you know, points that you're making or some merit, but be intentional about how you say something, right? Instead of the attack, give people a little bit of grace that they're trying to do their best, unless it's like outwardly just completely white supremacy and like what centering and totally fucked up, right? Yeah, sure. If, if people are just trying right now because everyone is demanding action, then give them the grace that they while maybe their intention and their impact didn't align, that their intention came from a place to help. And so you call them in. Yeah. Hey, Jason, did were you aware of? Did you know? Yeah. Uh, I'm finding some faults with maybe the way that you said this open to a conversation. That's an invitation. Yeah. And I guarantee you folks are going to be like, oh, I didn't see that. Thanks for making me aware. Let me go course correct. Okay, I'm going to go pay an educator. Right? Totally. That is how you engage in this. Yep. Because if I just outwardly like verbally thrashed and like banged on every white person that just always did it wrong, one, I wouldn't have a business. And two, <laughs> there would be no white folks that are, were in the, are in the streets protesting and signing, you know, petitions yeah. and so on and so forth. Y'all are going to get it wrong. Yeah. And right now is direct action, which means this is a moment to stop asking for permission to show up show up based on how leaders in this space are telling you to show up and then ask for forgiveness afterwards and go correct your behavior. Right on. That's killer. So the, what are like the three obvious no brainer things the white person can do right now? And I, I heard you sort of already mentioned a couple there, just like follow influencers like yourself that are actually taking action and reminding us, telling us what to do. Yep. Um, 
you know, don't sit there, uh, do engage in some way. You, you might not get it right and that's okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, sign petitions, uh, follow people on Instagram. They're actually, you know, making a difference here, especially people of color. What's another, what, what else can we be doing? And this is a question I, that actually got, uh, many responses here, which is like, uh, what can I do as a white person? And I, I'm getting, I'm, I'm reading just questions here in our yeah. big Facebook group. Uh, and the, the sort of theme is what is my first step? What can I do? Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. For this to all make sense, I'm going to give you my all the world's a stage analogy. And I think I came up with it after your, your cohort. So okay. it might be new to you. All but. right, cool. So Shakespeare said, all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. You can tell I'm a theater nerd. So yeah. Love it. Um, if all the world's a stage and everyone is just a player, they're playing their part. When we are in moments of crisis, when, when there is harm that is occurring, we need to center the most marginalized. So right now that's black folk. Black folks are on the stage. Black folks are the performers. They are dancing, right? They are being seen. They are visible. The responsibility for white folk and non-black folks of color, those who are not part of the African diaspora, do not have lineage and identify you know, with, with blackness, the role is of support staff. So you're the lighting crew. Mm -hmm. You're the tech crew. You're the orchestra. You're yeah. selling tickets. You're passing out flyers. You're doing yeah. marketing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You're making sure that the curtain goes up when it needs to go up and it goes down when it needs to go down. And so the first thing that everyone can do, this is why I say, one, listen to and follow the lead of those actors, of the dancers that are on the totally. stage. God, I love this metaphor. It's so straightforward. Yes. Thank you. I felt really fucking smart when I thought <laughs> it up. It's so I good. Like, oh, I, I just feel myself so relax. Like, okay, cool. Yeah. I know what to do now. Right? You know? So this is why we say, listen to, look to those folks. Let the light shine on them and your first, like any moment you're like, what do I do? What would the stage crew do if, you know, the curtain came down in the middle of the show? They would do everything that they could to make sure that that curtain goes back up. Yeah. What would you do in any moment to make sure that the light is being shown on those actors and that they're being supported so that their play can go on, so that the show can go on mm -hmm. seamlessly and that there's people in the audience. Yeah, and so so that the play can go on, so that we make we actually fucking have change here. And the, exactly, and the reason this metaphor is so good, if I do say so myself, is the second part is action. Every single one of those roles is actionable, right? Yeah. To sell a ticket, to pull up the cord for the you know the curtain, to be the lighting crew. That you're using your body. It it's great that people want to argue on the internet. Fine. And I'm also not saying that everybody has to be out in the street protesting. Just like a play, everybody plays a different part. Everyone's role is integral to the movement, yep. but they're all distinctly different. Mm -hmm. So some folks can be out in the street. Yep. Some folks, maybe your role is making all the phone calls. Maybe it's sending emails, right? Maybe it's making dinner and food for folks who are in direct action. Mm-hmm. Cause I'll tell you right now, if I didn't have my like white folks supporting me being like, can I bring you dinner? Can I order you food? I probably would not have eaten for like the last couple of days just cause I've been so in the work. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And that's not to be like, oh my God, I feel so bad for you. No, that's just the reality. Like you forget when you're in it or you're like, time is of the essence. The president just declared war on black bodies literally on Monday. That yeah. changes the landscape of things. I'm not oh going to sit God. here and make dinner. Right. Like I have work to do. There's action to be done. Yeah. Yeah, and we need you doing that action and it, we need to follow your lead. Exactly. Yeah. And so all of those little things are super important. So what, some languaging that I want to give people too, because the other thing is they're like, well, you know, I'm told, because this is true, right? Don't phone phone your black friend for like information. Like, don't do that. <laughs> don't Don't like just tap in and be like, hey, I don't understand. So one, it is not the responsibility of the oppressed to educate, hold space for, or make right. those who do not experience that oppression feel better. Two, folks that are directly impacted by this harm right now are going through their own human experience on top of being part of the fight in the movement. So it's super important to remember two things. One, your educational process needs to come specifically and explicitly from an anti-racist. I do want to make this distinction. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing a lot of people in the coaching industry right now, 
and you know who you are if I'm talking to you by the thing I'm going to say next. Looking for education from folks that do diversity, inclusion, inclusion and equity work, social impact strategy, instead of anti-racists. And the problem with that is that DEI and social impact work specifically relates to business. Mm. What policies are you creating? Your right, like your hiring process, cultural competency. What is your business social impact? Which is great, and that's a part of it. But anti racism is your internal process as a human, your conditioning, how you as an individual are showing up in the world, which, quite frankly, you have to do first to even be able to understand the second part, right? Like in your yeah. coaching business and your practice and your transformational business, shit in your relationships. Yeah. But so it's really important to make first that distinction. One, you need to be going and getting education explicitly from anti-racists or any the languaging can be different. Anti-racists, um, you know, folks that talk about like dismantling white supremacy, people that are speaking directly to that yeah. as an internalized process. Cool. And let me just pause. Can we define Please. racism for a minute? Um, yes. And can oh. I just take a stab at it for a second? Yeah. Let's see. Let's see if you remember. <laughs> I probably am going to fuck this up. Um, probably. It's, it's part fine. of my let's learning. Go. I mean, when I, when I think about racism, and especially right now, I think, and I, I just try to keep things simple, and I'm, I'm probably over re being reductionistic here. It's, I don't like you, hate you, want to kill you, hurt you, marginalize you, oppress you, only simply because you have a different color of skin than me. Yes, and. Okay. So two ands. One is... It's not always so obvious and blatant, right? Sometimes racism is very subtle. It shows up as microaggressions. Totally. It, yeah. it shows up as gaslighting. It shows up as the silencing and erasure of, of experiences of people of color, right? It can be really subtle. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff that happens under, that's, that's like if you're looking at a, you know, a mountain and mm -hmm. you see the clouds, like that's the part above the clouds. Okay. There's everything else below the clouds. But isn't it coming from the same place? And so this is what I would say. This is the second and. Okay. So because you don't actually have to hate somebody. There's a lot of folks that will say shit like, I don't see color. I'm not a racist. Not seeing color is actually rooted in white supremacy, racist culture. Right. That's that whole right? colorblind kind of myth, right? Yes, exactly. That actually can perpetuate racism. Absolutely. And so this is the more important and. Racism specifically is tied to power dynamics. So if we left it at your definition, that would be discrimination and prejudice. Okay. Which anyone, it is true. Anybody can, can be prejudicial or discriminatory, right? This is why we talk about anti-blackness even within communities of color. Okay. Anybody can feel that. Racism specifically is tied to the power dynamic of one race and in it globally, it's become the white race. White race, yeah. So white folks having the power to inflict any level of decision-making. It's not just harm, right? It's policies that negatively impact For folks sure. of color. Yeah. It's academic decisions, right? Educational decisions. Yeah. This is why we say it's a little bit more insidious because it's baked into every single part of our society. Yeah. But that is racism. Folks who do not hold white identity are capable of discrimination and, um, and prejudice, but they are not capable of racism because they cannot not pass power. laws. Exactly. Got it. They do okay. not have the power to make decisions yep. that impact other people's lives. So for example, if a black cop did the, if, if Derek Chauvin was black and George Floyd was white, Derek Chauvin would be in jail. Absolutely. It would, it would have been murder. No problem. Yep. But because of the power dynamic in this country and the way that laws, I think a lot of people don't understand um, and I won't go into it here because I've, I've taught it like in my podia and in other places that the police as they stand are direct uh, is a direct evolution of the slave patrol yeah. that never changed. Right. You can go Google this. I'm not making this up. This is historical. Yeah. yeah. And so because of that, all of the policies that have been created were created around maintaining the slave patrol and maintaining the purpose of the slave patrol. Yeah. That never changed. The training never changed. The cultural competency never changed. This is why we talk about police reform and abolitionism, right? None of that changed. Okay, so, so I'm, I'm getting a whole different layer of racism yeah, here. Yeah, there super is. That's super helpful, and I, I hope it'll be helpful for the listener, too. Yeah. And, and this is embedded in white supremacy, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So racism 
is the action that is upholding white supremacist culture and ideologies. Got it. Yep. And and white supremacy, uh, I, I've been thinking about this. I want to get your quick take on white supremacy yeah. real quick since we're here. Um, I'm a white guy, let's say, because mm -hmm. I am. And I yep. look around the world, right? Yeah. And I see white people in power. Yep. I see maybe Hispanic people not in power. I see black people not so much in power. And mm -hmm. so therefore I justify my subjective reality with, well, white must be better. Correct. Right? And so therefore mm -hmm. I'm gonna keep adhering to this system. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And so, and the roots of that, just to like give you the little nerd out so that it's like to really contextualize it for people. In 1448, when Prince Henry started the, what is what we now understand as a transatlantic slave trade in Portugal, in order to justify the kidnap, buying, and selling of human bodies, African black bodies, he did two things. He had, who was not a scientist, but a, an author that was popular at the time, he paid him to write out an, a hierarchy of, this is when race, this is literally when race was created, a hierarchy of quote unquote race. And at the time it was just white, black, red, and yellow. Red being indigenous folks as we know them now and yellow being Asian folks. And he, cre he literally numbered them, categorized them from white being at the top, black being at the bottom. And then he had him fill in all of these character traits, which we still see present today. All of the general, like the really negative stereotypes yeah. that we have associated to race yeah. were created then. And yeah. he did that so that they could not, they could justify enslaving black Africans and using them for labor. And then also the genocide of the indigenous American population. So everything that we see today, that is white supremacy it was created to justify the atrocities that were committed against yeah. indigenous and black bodies. Yeah. Savvy. Yeah, it yeah. is. And, yeah. and, and again, this is like, this is why we need all the context and the history to understand, like we didn't get here overnight and it also hasn't just been 400 years, right? Like 1448. That's a long time. Right. <laughs> totally. So, so white people, a lot of us white people can't see how insidious it is. Correct. It does look obvious when we look at pictures of the White House cabinet and we just see mm -hmm. white dudes, mm -hmm. you know, with gray hair. Right. It's just like, guys, this is like an old boys network. Hello, can anyone yeah. fucking see this? Am I the only person that sees this? <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like a fraternity. Um, but we, that might be semi-obvious to some of us, but, but yeah. the day in and day out, because we don't experience the microaggressions, mm -hmm. we remain completely, uh, I guess you could say, blind to mm -hmm. what's actually occurring here. So this is why, to me, it's so essential to listen mm -hmm. to other people's experience, people of color specifically, and in this moment, black people. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm just also wondering, like, other than, um, like, kind of opening your eyes and, like, looking around, it seems like if white people just hang out with white people and we're sort of live in our insulated little bubbles that we're not gonna actually see or experience this very much. Therefore, hey, I'm not in pain, I'm not gonna do much for this. I, I don't, it's not affecting me. Yep. And this is the problem, we're talking about white privilege now, this is the problem yeah. with that, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm like, I don't know what else to add, that was great, <laughs> I taught you all. Well. <laughs> no, that, I mean, and, and that's exactly it. That's also, you know, just to bring it back contextually for people who this might be new for, that is also not by accident. The culture of whiteness, right. and when we talk about whiteness, we talk about the, like literally the culture of white supremacy. We're not just talking about white people. The culture of whiteness can't see outside of itself because yeah. it never had to, yeah. right? It was built on the notion that those that did not hold white identity were literally not human. And so all of those blind spots have been, literally they have become part of white identity. Yeah. For worse, right? It's not that, and again, it's very, it's intentional, but people don't realize that's why it's unconscious. Yeah. And in order to maintain that, there have been, right, like redlining and housing laws, academic segregate, like we, we want to act like segregation's over, but we just have, you know, we've desegregated some laws, mm -hmm. but some partially folks self-segregate and partially we still have how like certain housing laws and you know educational laws and how and like all the things like that are wrong with healthcare and so on and so forth that actually continue to maintain the segregation amongst races. Yeah. And so if you never have to experience see somebody else's experience, yeah. 
you're one, never going to think about it. Two, it's never going to be real to you. And this is one of the reasons why I'm just going to say this here because this is a conversation that's happening a lot right now among the, amongst the anti-racist and activism community is this is why we keep seeing what we're calling what's called black trauma porn, which is the constant like digital wa- spreading of like wildfire of videos of black folks being reduced to their last moments of dehumanization in order to activate white folks. Because white folks have never had to see it. They don't understand it. For folks of color and specifically black folks, if that's been a part of your reality the whole time, you don't need to see a picture of a white man with his knee on George Floyd's neck to know that that is what happened. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But white folks have been the biggest, especially the white liberal, has been the biggest perpetrator of spreading black trauma porn. And it needs to stop, right? Ask yourself, why do I actually have to see a human murdered, brutalized, it's good, right? Lynching postcards were a thing. People used to go to lynchings and set up picnics and watch it and take pictures with the hung body. It's the same thing. It's a digital lynching postcard. Right. Ask yourself why you need to see that before you can get mobilized to action to ask for justice and or reform. Yeah, and are you saying, like, help me understand the intent there? Because yeah. uh, on one level I could see, like, yeah, we need to see that because it wakes us up. And you're saying, well, why do you need to see that to wake you Correct. up? Correct. And who who's who are you saying is responsible for that? And what what would their intent be? Yeah, I mean, the intention of all people, because it's not just like white folks that do this, right? Yeah. All folks keep sharing this. Yeah. Um, the reason that I'm saying who's mo- most responsible are white liberals, because it's like the well-intentioned white folks. Oh, yeah that are right, like they're liberal and they're like they think that they're doing it right, and they're like on the side of anti-racism and we have to do something. So they're like, look, 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 this happened. See, it's true. Instead of saying, well, we have civil rights museums. We have every documentary of every, like Malcolm X was assassinated by the FBI, right? Or I'm sorry, MLK. Well, I think Malcolm X was too, but MLK was assassinated by the FBI via COINTELPRO. Like there is proof. There's documentation. We have pictures, so this like reactionary rage or this like the empathy that comes up for just a minute is right. part of the problem. Yeah, yeah. Because okay. if you had done your anti-racist work, right? Like Jason, if we're sitting down and I'm like, I just got a text message that, you know, whatever. One of my best friends was, God forbid, let me not put it on my cousin. Somebody I know, you know, was shot and murdered by the police. They had no guns on them, no drugs. All they did was run a stop sign. You've already committed to anti-racism, right? You've been in a course. Mm-hmm. You've had your awareness expanded. You understand, like, it's always a journey, yeah. period, right? You don't ever get to Woke Mountain, the top yeah. of it. There's no top. But I would wager that you wouldn't need to see a video to believe that yeah, that is yeah. what happened. Correct. I wouldn't need to see right? a video. Right? Yep. So the problem is that it's a bunch of folks who are not actionably anti-racist. They're just casually not racist, which are different things. Mm-hmm using the dehumanization of black folk that has been digitally captured in order to like corral themselves into movement. And the problem with that is one, it's incredibly traumatizing and re-traumatizing for black folk, right? There is a video of a small black girl, a young black girl who is literally sobbing to her father because she's old enough to be on social media and she has seen all of this and she's literally just sobbing. And all she's saying over and over again is, I don't like, I don't want to live in this skin because they will kill me for it. She's like 12. Mm -hmm. This is the impact of spreading that. Yeah. So the next thing to do is stop spreading it and start committing to the education. Yeah. Yep. Right. Because the last part of that, and I'm just going to add this because what's happening is people are going to the protests, but then when the protest is over because they've now been desensitized one to the murdering of black folk. And so they just get riled up for the moment then they're no longer part of the voting process. They're no longer part of the reform process. They're no longer, we have to change the system. The equation isn't changing the hashtags just are. The Mm -hmm. names of the people that are being murdered just are. Yep. Right? So it's time to make an anti-racist commitment instead of just getting activated every single time you see somebody lynched on the internet. Right. Totally. God damn. Wow. Okay. So um, white liberal person instead can do education. Um, yes. the, the actionable thing for them is to cool, uh, stop, drop and listen, yeah. educate, yeah. follow yeah. people who are, um, 
people of color, black people mm-hmm. who are mm-hmm. uh, telling, basically telling us what to do. Yep. Yeah. That's kind of the, again, I love the theater metaphor, like they're on yeah. stage, let's support. I'm in a supporting right. role right now. Yeah. And just like you would, if there was a play going on on stage, you would just listen and you would believe them, right? Because they're acting. Yeah. Believe them. Yeah, totally. Okay, cool. I want to um, get a couple of questions here from our Let's do it. our listeners. Um, there's so many. Uh, let's see here. Um, okay, David's got one. Uh, I haven't read this all the way through, so I haven't screened these questions, so feel free to nix any of these. Cool. Uh, David says, I support peaceful protests and also understand that sometimes people get fed up with not being heard and have to rise up loudly. I'm confused about how to be a good ally when I don't support the looting and rioting and have heard numerous times from the black community, don't tell black people how to behave. I feel conflicted because I want to help, but do not know how to come across as being condescending or pejorative, but I also do not want to appear to condone violence and looting either. I love this question because I'm about to like blow some people's minds. Mind you, for context, I have been in direct, when we talk about direct action, we be, we talk about protest and like being a part of it. Yeah. Went to my first direct action when I was 12. I grew up in Oakland, so I'm not new to this. I was in mm-hmm. Ferguson, Missouri for 15 months after Michael Brown was killed. So for those that are like, what is she talking about? Like I'm talking about like from a context of historically being either in it and or part of the organizing movement. Yeah. So let us be very clear about a couple of things. When people say, do not tell black folk how to rise up, let's put an asterisk on that. If you are silent when it came to speaking up for our justice, do not talk to us about how we are allowed to ask for it. Mm-hmm. So that's the first thing. Yeah, that's big. Yep. Second thing. I think a lot of people don't realize this, and I want everybody to go spend some time Googling COINTELPRO, C-O-I-N-T-E-L, PRO. It was an FBI government-sanctioned initiative that was created to take down the civil rights movement and specifically the Black Panthers that involved a process of infiltration, disruption, and actively reinforcing notions that Black folk were aggressive and or did not deserve the humanization that they were asking for. Now, what does that look like today? That looks like a bunch of police. And if, again, if you're not involved in direct action, then you don't know this, right? And this is one of the reasons why Facebook is currently, or IG is currently trying to censor me and ban me because I have dedicated my Instagram page to making sure that everyone I know that is involved in direct action across this country that's taking videos and pictures of these things that they're sending to me and I'm posting it. Mm -hmm. Police officers and FBI agents show up at protests and you will know them because they have their police boots on and they typically have an armband on of certain colors, depending on which department they are with and or if they are just a police police and or if they're FBI so that they can tell each other apart. You will also be able to tell because no matter how hot it is outside, they will have extra layers on to hide the fact that they have a vest on underneath. Mm -hmm. They'll have a bulletproof vest on and their sole purpose is to agitate. That means busting in windows. That means starting fires. That means starting agitation with police officers. Oh, my intentionally. God. Yeah. That is on purpose. There, I have literally hours of footage on my phone from the last couple of weeks of police officers hopping out of their own cars and destroying the car, lighting it on fire, and walking away in the middle of protests. And then the camera crews show up. And they're framing, hours, it, framing black people. Exactly. Yeah. Hours of white folk busting in windows, tearing things up, and spray painting BLM and Black Lives Matter all over the place, and black folks begging them to stop screaming, don't you know that they're going to blame this on us? Right. So let's be very clear. It's not black folks looting. It's not black folks. Do you know that they have been placing shards of glass and piles of bricks in the middle of cities directly in in the protest route. So then what happens is these infiltrators and agitators, they're already set up. Why would you put a pile of bricks in the middle of a city when you know that a tr- like a, a protest is coming through wow. unless you have folks in the crowd? Oh my God. You can Google this. Yeah. I'm not making this up. And a lot of the information is redacted because the FBI obviously does not want you to know, but it's been long enough where a lot of it is public. There are documentaries on this. This is not new. So 
if you're a person that is listening and you're like, I don't understand why black folk would do this because it's not black folk doing this. And because black folk have always been framed as aggressive, as angry, as deserving less than. Mm -hmm. So how do you reinforce that narrative? You create, yeah. right? You, you create infiltrators and you set it up. It's a setup. Yeah. Yeah. And then you make sure that the media shows up. Totally. If you look at the media right now, somebody is currently like putting clips together and they're just cutting. It's 30 seconds of every single media around the nation and every single one of them is saying the exact same thing because that's the narrative that they've been told to push. So it's time for people to start using their critical thinking hats and their discernment yeah. and actually addressing their unconscious bias because it's not us. Yep. It really isn't. Weez, where, where do you recommend we get our news? Um, certainly we can follow influencers like you. Like where, yeah. where do we get our information right now? Unicorn Riot is a um, really, really dope organization. Um, they stream and they provide as much information as possible. They are independently funded. So if you're also looking for people to donate to, Unicorn Riot is a dope organization that, that um, is really committed to providing news that is completely unbiased and that is actually in support of anti-racism and not in a way that it's like, we're going to paint everybody as, you know, good and great and fine. Um, also, I'm going to put an asterisk on what I said previously for people that are like, oh, but I've seen black folks doing, you know, looting or whatever. We are also uh, at a, there are 40 million people that are currently unemployed in this country because oh, yeah. of COVID. Yeah. So let's also recognize the fact that we have a higher unemployment rate than we have had since the Great Depression. People don't have jobs. They don't have health care. They don't have food. They can't even buy toilet paper. So some people are not looting for the fun of it. Some people are looting because they are literally in desperation. Yeah. Yeah. They're in deep, deep stress. This is what Correct. human beings do when their survival needs are at stake. Exactly. Yeah. So I also want to put that asterisk out there. Okay. Yeah. That's super helpful. Whew. Okay. That was, uh, that's an intense layer there. Thank that you. That was heavy. That. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Big time. I'm just feeling the weight of that over here. Yeah. Um, uh, Fadishta is saying, can you elaborate on examples of unchecked, unexamined white privilege? If you are not an actionable anti-racist, then you have unchecked, unexamined white privilege. I'm, I'm not sure if that like answers it. I think that's, that's well, pretty, but like that's, bam. that's really what it is. Yeah. Because if you were an anti-racist, you would have already gone through the process to look at it. And this, this is a follow-up question that might might be the same here, which is Daniel asks, what are some examples of covert racism that a white person who thinks they are not racist might unwillingly exhibit? Mm. Wearing people's, you know, authentic cultural garb as Halloween costumes. Mm. Taco Tuesday, showing up with a, you know, sombrero and whatever else you think represents being Mexican. Mm -hmm. Um touching and or asking to touch black women's hair. I'm trying to give like really basic everyday little ones. Yeah. Um, <laughs> saying like when, when somebody says something, right. Just in general, as a human person, like, Hey, you did that thing and it bothered me. And the white response is like, but I'm not a racist or like, right. Like going into that defense mode, like mm -hmm. I'm just a person of color that happened to say a thing. Yeah. Um, those are some really small examples, like bigger examples of covert racism would be, um, you know, white splaining and or gaslighting, um, a person of color when they are telling you their lived experience, um, yeah. thinking that you are entitled to pick their brain, right? Like I can't tell you what my DMS look like right now. <laughs> I just have a quick question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what? Also, it's never quick. We're talking about racism and white supremacy, right? All of that is rooted in covert racism. Because remember, racism was created as an action to uphold white supremacy. And white supremacy says the labor, the bodies, the intellectual property, anything that comes from that which is not white is owned by whiteness. Mm -hmm. It is rooted in the slave industrial complex, which says that all things, both body and production that come from black folk and folks of color is owned by white folk. Damn. How can, this is a, I think a question in here, but how, the, the people that are DMing you, right? Like I could see myself being a person that DMs you like, Hey, Louise, like, what about this? And I just want to like check myself here. Like, 
Yeah. Like when we, when we look to our um, people of color or sort of allies or friends and we're like wanting information, uh, like you said, education, uh, there's a setup there that doesn't feel good to people of color. Mm-hmm. Um, what's the, maybe you've already said this, but remind us, what's the alternative? What's our, what's our move there? Yeah. So the first thing is Google it. Google it before, and I, and I understand that sometimes Google is not completely accurate. There's a lot of bullshit on the internet, but there's certain things, right, that are Googleable, or at least will start to get you in the right direction. But if you're somebody like me who is literally dedicated, right, to anti-racism education, I have put out a lot of work and or I've already layered in like my links, for example, in IG of like where to go for what. Yeah. So ha- the first thing is really, have you actually taken it upon yourself first before you played phone a black friend or phone, phone a, you know, a person of color to answer this for me? <laughs> totally. Right? Or if we're talking about trans issues because it's Pride Month, like phone a trans friend. Like, have you actually looked to see if that person already has laid it out for you? That's yeah. the first thing. Yeah. Second thing is make sure that person is explicitly an educator. This is not an opportunity for you to just start picking the brain of folks who hold the marginalized identity because being an educator requires training and education and yeah. skill set and all those other things. Yeah. Right. Yeah, totally. And the third thing is if you get to a point where you're really, cause I don't ever mind this. If you get to a point where you're really like, I've exhausted the options. I Googled, I looked through all your links, you know, whatever, whatever. Don't just offload the question. Hey, here's my six paragraphs about what I want to know. I'm not reading that, first of all, because it's already signaled that you have not thought to consent me on your access to me, right? Consent is important. So first, even if you slide in the DM, hey, I've looked through, I've taken XYZ precautions. I've done the things preemptively. I'm having a hard time finding XYZ, or there are some questions I'd like to ask you. What would it look like to compensate you for that? Yeah. Because yep. sometimes the answer for me is like, oh, go to my podia. I have, a, I have a community call every month where we jump on Zoom and I answer all the questions, right? Like, that's an easy one. Or yeah. it, maybe it's something bigger. Here's my, here's my link to purchase a one-off session and schedule it, right? We have these things set up. So ask yeah. us how first. I, I'm loving this because it's, you're, you're, honestly, it's like really respecting your time too and, and just who you are. And, yep. and uh, it, it, uh, I know when I'm in shortcutter mode, right? I want to go to the source first because it's easier, especially if I have access to the source, right? It's, yeah. it's like I'm taking a shortcut instead of right. doing the work, which is like, actually, I need to sit down and see if I can find the answer myself first so I don't bother this person. Right. Right. And then you're, you've said this many times in the course I took with you, which is like you're asking, you continue to, white people continue to ask people of color to do the emotional labor. Yeah. Right. Right. And the thing is, uh, there's the second part of that sentence, which like a lot of folks just like to leave off. And then they're like, I'm going to go ask some a white person instead, which y'all need to stop looking at white educators for anti-racism because white folks cannot both be the poison and the antidote. You can't. Right. And the culture of whiteness means it can't see outside of itself. Right. Yeah. So how can it hold a mirror up to you if it can't even see it in itself or themselves rather? Um, it's the for free part. Stop expecting emotional, mental, intellectual, educational labor for free from folks of color, expressly black, black folks, right? People forget the for free part because yeah. we have paid containers. Yeah. Like, just ask us how you can compensate us. Totally. Right? You're not going to go to your doctor and be like, hey, uh, can you check this thing out real quick? But for like, free. Exactly. I expect you to do it for free. Like, yeah. you're not going to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Good call. Um, cool. A couple more here. Um, Let's do it. Uh, Judy, if a white woman... Are we live? No. Oh. No, just recording. Um, if a, I just asked people ahead of time. I just said, hey, if you have questions. All good. Uh, if a white woman wanted to know how she could support black women in the workplace community as a friend right now, what would she need from her? What would she need to ask her to say or do? Okay. Super great question and really simple answer. Real simple. And I'm going to contextualize this first. And I said this earlier in the episode, black folks are going through a human experience right now. And that might mean that they don't even want to deal with white folks and not because they don't love you or they think you're a racist, but because dealing with whiteness and the labor of having to engage with that is so much more than what they're already dealing with. Yeah. Okay. So that being said, real simple, I don't expect a reply. 
I just want to let you know that I see you. And if I can support you in any way, I am here. That's it. Don't make it about yourself. Yeah. Don't tell black folks that you're so upset and you're sad and right. Like that's white centering. We don't do that. Right. Cause they're not making it about me. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. And do not put them in a position where they feel obliged to answer you, especially in the workplace. Because what happens is in the workplace, if we have a power dynamic, right? If you're like a supervisor, the response, and I will tell you this because I was on the phone with my homegirl yesterday and she was like, damn it, my boss keeps texting me. Like, I don't want to deal with white people right now. <laughs> but she's like, but it's my boss and I don't want to get fired, uh -huh. you know, or like be rude. So make sure you are explicitly saying, I do not expect a response. Like I alleviate you from the burden of responding to me if that's not what you want to do. Yeah. I see you. I acknowledge what's going on. I'm here to support you. Once you tell me what that looks like, because also do not make an assumption of what support looks like. People need different things right now and in, di in different ways at different times because it's a roller coaster of emotion and experience. Yeah, this is huge. And, and we teach some version of this in the relationship school of like acknowledging the other person before we come in with our feelings. Yes. Yeah, you know? it's the same thing. Yeah, uh, white centering for a minute. I just want to use myself as an example, uh, just because you yeah. mentioned it, um, just to educate people here. So um, that was enlightening for me when you taught me about white centering, and I I did it the other day. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I did my post George Floyd. Oh my God, this is fucked up. And I went right to because I'm a relationship guy. I went right to trying to understand the white guy and his his traumatic childhood, like man, this guy must have been fucking beat down when he was a kid and blah, blah, blah. And so the post became about the white guy. Mm, mm -hmm. That's white centering, yeah? So, yes, and sometimes it can even be, it's like the self, it's your self-centering if you hold a white identity because yeah. you don't know how to do anything else other than to center yourself. Right, okay. Wow. Right, and the other thing I'll say is Derek Chauvin might have had the most beautiful childhood but if he was raised in a household that did not check supremacy totally. and or was not actively anti-racist, then he grew up thinking that what he just did was totally acceptable. Yeah, totally right. Yeah, he was brainwashed into that. Yeah. Absolutely. But I, I just want to explicitly say that for followers that are new to this. Yeah, that's good. That's really helpful. So how do, how do we white characters talk about our experience without hogging the mic and yeah. doing white centering? Yeah. So a couple things. You can talk about your experience with other white folk. Be upset, be outraged, be all the things with other white folks. Yep. Not in the presence of black folk. That's the first thing. If you are going to do it publicly, remember, you still get to be a human. Right? Like you still get to say. Yeah. Well, I'm going through a lot because of this I, or whatever. My heart hurts right now yeah. for black folk. Yeah. I am enraged at the state of this country, right? Maybe one or two sentences and then make sure you then go into like what, centering black folk, Yeah. right? So you get to be a human, but when we talk about white centering, I'll give you a perfect example because it's coaching industry. Okay. <laughs> oh, this post, I was just like, thank God I got kicked off Facebook. It was a post that said, it was like three paragraphs about her and how much she'd been crying and how she hadn't been able to sleep. And she was so concerned about, you know, it made her think of her own child who, mind you, is a what little white boy. And I was like, really, we're talking about Timmy? I don't know that that's his name, but in my head, yeah. that's his name. Yeah. And, you know, three paragraphs about how upset she was and the emotional toll it was taking on her. Maybe half a paragraph about maybe what she thought black folk were going through. And then comes back to herself and says, and so I'm going to donate money, basically like a gold stars type situation. And if you donate money, I'll give you 50% off of my marketing course. Once you, if you send me the receipt and I'll, you know, right. Like, and it was like, yeah. and I'll give you a coupon code, ma'am. What? Yeah. Like that one was egregious. Okay. Even if she had left the marketing part off, like yep. she made it about her. Yeah. This is really hard for white people, I gotta say. We are so yes. fucking self-absorbed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? But we've also lived in a society, I mean, even folks of color have been taught to center white folks. Yeah. It's also our work to learn to center ourselves. Right. Because we all we all live in a white is right society. Yeah. Okay, another one here. Um, okay. Damn. 
Uh, okay, uh, Leonora says, I'm at the park yesterday, and a five-year-old black boy told me that white people kill black people. I said, yes, they do, but you are safe right now. I'm worried now that I said the wrong thing. Any, on, any advice on how to talk to kids? How honest should I be? Well, if they're not your children, it's not your call, right? But in that situation, I think you handled it well. I think that, that right? Like, yeah, that is, that's true. Like, and right now you're safe. Yeah. Right? Um, in general, because I actually teach a workshop on how to talk to our kids about race. And the first half of that workshop is actually, have you talked to yourself about race? Have you become an anti-racist? Because as early as three months old, children start to exhibit physical behavior in reaction to different races based on how they've observed their parents react Absolutely. to those races. Absolutely. Okay. There's a, like a lot of data in science. For those I didn't say I'm a sociologist like by training and actual study and like academic degree. So we won't get into all the science behind it, but there are studies to prove that. So the first thing is y'all have to be anti-racist because children are watching everything, absolutely everything. As early as three months old, they are being taught to either oppress and or be an anti-racist, mm -hmm. right? Depending on you. The next thing is be as absolutely honest with your children as possible. Obviously keeping it age appropriate, depending on how old the child is, yeah. right? Um, and, and making it, you can't make it fun, but you can make it a process of like inquiry. The thing that I tell parents most of the time is when a kid says something to you, right? Like this is one that actually I hear all the time because I used to be a teacher, right? Like a, a white kid will come home and say something like, you know, the black kids at school were being were like names that were being used like chocolate milk or sometimes like much worse. Ask, starting to just ask the kid like, well, why would you, why would you say that? Well, where did you get that from? Mm -hmm. Right? Or like that process of inquisition and then make it a learning moment, but make it a learning moment with them. Even if you have the answer, yeah. right? Like, yeah. hey, why don't you come with like mo mo mom, dad, help mom, dad, auntie, uncle, whoever you are to them, right? Like figure out like why we say things like that that are actually not really nice. Yeah. Yep. And simultaneously do not vilify children and or shame children for making observations. We, the same way that we sexualize the things that kids say, we racialize the things that kids say. Mm. So if a five-year-old says something like, that black woman's hair is like, you know, braided or different, the, our first reaction is like, don't say that. We've immediately taught them that recognizing race is shameful and or is bad. Mm. Right? So you say things like, instead, it is really, it is really nice or it is, it is different. What are five like compliments or five things that we could say? Yeah. To like, let her know how much we like it or, you know, right. Like yeah. the same way you would with anything else. Yeah. yeah so those nice. would be my like little quick nuggets. Cause that's a three hour workshop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. Um, couple more here and then I'll let okay. you go. Uh, All right. this, cause I mean, I could sit here for hours with you and just, I, and anyway, um, <laughs> but I'm going to be going to your Instagram feed instead <laughs> and getting educated. So uh, a friend of mine, I'm just going to kind of keep this anonymous. Uh, a friend of mine, okay mom of an adopted uh, black boy mm, who's okay. uh, tween uh, says to me recently, hey, um, we're really concerned about him given the state of the world right now, yep. but we're really lucky because he hasn't experienced any racism yet. Yes, and I was like, what? <laughs> I was like, what are you talking about? You haven't, yeah. he hasn't experienced racism yet. My yeah. wife and I were like, wait a minute. So <laughs> Like, what's the, what's the response to, I, I feel like she's way in the dark here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because he hasn't had any overt sort of racism toward him. Like, he hasn't been bullied or made fun of or right. picked on or something. Or Yeah, but, I mean, racism is the fact that history in school is white history and that black history is not taught. That's racism. Right. Right? Racism is the fact that probably he is always picked first when there's a sports situation. Right. Racism is the fact that people probably like within us because if he's a teen, I'm going to I'm going with like school situations. Right. Because um, he's not in the workplace that probably at school, people assume that he is even maybe just an athlete instead of a musician or a scientist or, you mm -hmm. know, what have you. 
Um, racism is the fact that if, cause I guarantee you, your kid goes to parties. If you're listening, let's just be honest. If the cops show up to a party and all the kids are right, run, kids are running away, your son will be chased and they will let all the white kids go. Yeah. Right. Right. That is all racism. And it's not because and he might not even recognize it. Right. He might come home. He might get away, but all of that is racism because those are all the actions that have been built into our society to uphold white supremacy. Yeah. Racism is the way that people look at him right. when he walks down the street. Yeah. Or when he walks into a store. Or he walks into a store. Or the way he gets followed in a store. Yeah. When he walks down the street and maybe somebody crosses it or a woman holds her purse a little bit tighter. Yeah. And you don't see it as a, as a transracial adopter, right? Like as a parent as a, that holds a different racial identity than their adopted child because you are blind to it mm -hmm. because you are white. Yeah. Because whiteness cannot see outside of itself. Right. Dude, this is so intense because I just want to, I want to ask you just kind of a personal question. Do you, yeah. tell me about the hope you have because when I, when I kind of, when we get in here, I'm like, fuck, this is deeply embedded yeah. in our, in our like yeah. psyche, right? The white supremacy is like deep in here. Yeah. So talk to me about hope and what, what gives you, what has you wake up in the morning and want to fight this fight and be like, let's kick some ass today. Let's, let's yeah. So fight. a couple things. One is, so I call like white anti-racists, the shields, like maybe that might change, but like Beyonce has her bees. Rihanna has her Navy. I call them the shields and the tagline is like popping up when shit pops off. Um, right. And so I'm, I've been in this work for so long and I've watched so many people move yeah. from some, even like go from Trump supporter avid Trump supporter to anti-racist. That's right? a big leap. Yeah. And That's it took cool. a lot of work and right. it's possible, right? It's inspiring, yeah. So that gives me hope. Um, what also gives me hope, honestly, is like this new young generation. The, the young, younger generation, and I say that like I'm old, uh, you know, I'll be 35 soon, but um, that next generation, man, they are like really, they're already out like, just by nature of the way that they're growing up together in community already are like speaking to things with the eloquency that grownups cannot speak to white mm -hmm. grownups cannot speak to. Yeah. Right. Um, and the last thing honestly is I think it's like epigenetically imprinted in the souls of folks of color and those that come from like a lineage and, you know, of the African diaspora, because We've all, we've just always had to have hope. Even in moments of trial and tribulation, we have found joy. Like this is the thing that you're not seeing on the news. Yeah. There are full dance parties at the protest. You know, yeah. there are folks having dance battles in the middle of a protest, singing songs. Like that is, that is like part of the movement is like joy and community and love. And because I hold the belief that with every generation, it does get better right? Like yeah. we are able to yeah. fight in the I way that, that we are now because my aunties did it yeah. because their aunties did well and uncles and like, you know, and, and, yeah. and non-binary folk and all the folks before them did it. So what yeah. gives me hope is that with every generation there is progress. Yeah. And then we'll pass the torch to the next one. And like I said, that next generation, man, they're killing the game. I'm so proud of them. Uh, I don't I'm, even know them. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, fi I'm fired up just in general. Uh, uh, the self-awareness I think is, is one of the things I'm most inspired by, yeah. by young people. Yeah. The willingness to look at themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, Weez, it's been, again, an honor, a treat. Um, thanks for being my mentor here. No um, problem. And uh, I'm learning tons from you. And hopefully this has been useful for our listeners. I'm sure I it is, so. especially my white folk listeners. <laughs> yeah. Um, where can people find you, follow you, uh, jam with you, whatever, learn from you? Yeah. According to Weez on IG, I no longer exist on Facebook for okay. a variety of reasons, one of which is because Facebook wiped me out. Okay. Um, so, and it's all spelled regularly. So, so according lame. to Weez, W-E-E-Z, -E -E, um, you can find me there. And then you can also, I use Podia instead of Patreon, but all of those links are in my Instagram. So it's super easy. Just come find me on Instagram. Okay. Awesome. And, um, do you and or Trudy have any classes coming up, uh, this year I have, on, I have a workshop coming up. Yep. So, um, I have a workshop starting on June 18th. It is a four-part like webinar workshop series. 
that takes people through the process from literally like understanding the constructs of race and the purpose for the constructs of race and then the culture of, of race and culture of white supremacy and white identity, fragility, all of those things that are coming up in you. And then the last part is how to move into being an anti-racist. It's like the crash course because everybody needs a crash course right now, right? Like big time, big, big time. So even like my programs now are more like four to six month programs to take people through a true, like full anti-racist process. But this is one of those, like the people are begging for it. And, and this is actually for white folks, black folk, purple, orange, red, brown. It doesn't matter okay. um, because this isn't a coaching program, right? When it's coaching and we're taking people through a transformational process, we do it in affinity groups. Yeah. This is like straight up information, education, jump on this webinar, get this learning, ask the questions in real time. And if you can't make it real time, there will be a recording. Um, and again, that link will be on my Instagram and like you, so it'll be in my bio. You'll see it as a swipe up feature. Like you'll just follow me and you'll see it. You'll find it. But okay. that starts. Yeah. June 18th. Okay. Killer. That's coming up. We're going to release yeah. this, uh, next week, uh, hopefully if not sooner. So cool. people listening can not only follow you according to Wheeze on Instagram, but the link to sign up for that is in your Instagram. Yes. Great. And Amazing. even if you sign up late, it's one, it's like every, it's every week for four weeks. So you'll get the replay of the first one and then you can jump in on the other ones. Okay. Free course, paid course. Uh, it is going to be paid, but it's super accessible. It's $97. Oh dude. I'm right. No brainer. I'm literally giving it away because I want people, yeah. I want people to understand that they have to pay for it. Yeah. Right? You have to pay for education yeah. and I need this to be as accessible as possible to as many people as possible. Cause that is what the fight is about right now. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Okay. I'm going to spread the word. I'm going to get a lot of people cool. there. Yeah. Dope. Hell yeah. Okay. Wonderful to see you. Um, you too. Virtual hug from far away. Yes. Thanks Air for hugs. helping us out. No problem. All right. The action step here is to take action in some way. All right. If you're drawn to take action. And as you can see, I'm fumbling through my way. Um, I'd rather take action and fumble my way and learn than to be silent and freeze, stay in my freeze response. So uh, I would follow Weeze. She's a great resource. Um, according to Weeze on Instagram, at according to Weeze. Okay, so that's her Instagram handle. She's posting multiple times a day and uh, really, you know, confronting edgy, important, essential stuff for uh, people to learn here. Okay, um, cool. And I think the other action step I would share with you guys is to, and she's going to be doing a class June 18th, I should think she said four weeks. And uh, I would definitely sign up for that. But I currently going to her website and on Instagram, I can't find the link. So by the time you listen to this, hopefully there'll be one. Regardless, if you follow her, I'm sure she's going to announce it. So uh, I think it'd be an awesome course. And when I do, I'll try to send something out about that. Okay. Uh, the other action step again is to get in relationship with one other person in your life and continue to get honest. I mean, all of us are probably talking to our friends about what's going on in the world. And can you go a layer down, a layer deeper? So if you're a white person, perhaps you could talk about your privilege or the ways in which you're kind of blind to, um, the ways in which you don't see what black people see. I think, uh, I know my wife and I are having many, many really, uh, enlightening, intense conversations about this at our home, uh, and then t chatting with our kids about it as well. So uh, yeah, I just want, I just want us to get even more honest and transparent with our journey and what, what we struggle with here. If you're a person of color or if you're black, um, you know, I don't need to tell you what to do. Um, and I just appreciate you hanging in there and listening and um, being, uh, being here. Um, one thing I can continue to offer, and I will continue to offer for the rest of my life, is skills and tools on how we listen better and how we can work through our differences together better. I will always do that, and um, that's where I'm going to you know, continue to focus my energy here, as well as contributing um, and giving uh, amplifying voices of color right now, especially black folks. Um, got another podcast coming out um, soon with a couple of black gentlemen that I think you'll enjoy as well. All right, we're always open to feedback. You can just email us at info at relationshipschool.com. And um, here's to a more equitable world. 
that is puts an end to racism. Okay, talk soon. Hey, thanks so much for listening. Please subscribe to this YouTube channel. Share one of these videos with a friend. We want to help the planet get their act together around relationships. And you are one of them, so thank you.